Well, I want to begin this morning by welcoming you all here to Gettysburg National Military Park and our 10 o'clock program, our, our special program today, our Battle Walk. My name is Dan Welch, and I'm going to be with you for about the next two to two and a half hours today as we examine the events of July 2nd, 1863 through the eyes of one unit, men from the state of Florida. Uh, now, as some of you were here about 10, 15 minutes ago, it's kind of given some some public service announcements about what we're going to be in for today. Although it is gorgeous this morning, it has not been great weather the last couple of days. So uh, if you have a bug spray, load up. If you've got sunscreen, load up. If you've got water, you were debating on whether to bring it, get it out of the car. Uh, if you've got a change of shoes, if you were debating between the boots being too hot, too heavy versus the tennis shoes, get the boots. Uh, it rained a whole heck of a lot yesterday, and I was out on the field bright and early this morning. It is very muddy. It's very, very muddy. Uh, but we'll avoid as much of it as we can. Uh, as far as any questions today, that is what I am here for. Uh, most of you, except this young man here, paid for me back in April. So make sure you get your money's worth out of me today as we make our way through the program. Uh, I just ask that you hold on to those questions until we're walking from stop to stop. Come on up to the front of the column. Love to talk with you or at the end of the program, we'll find a shady spot to retreat to and chat as long as you'd like, whether that be about the Floridians or visiting the park or the visitor center, any other questions that you may have. Well, with that, let's go ahead and begin the story of the Floridians here at Gettysburg. And unfortunately for a long period of our history following the American Civil War, it was a story that has often been neglected and overlooked. So much so that our story doesn't even begin in 1863 here at the Battle of Gettysburg, but actually almost a hundred years later, in 1962. In the fall of 1962, there was a congressman from the state of Florida that came up here to Gettysburg, not a, too far of a drive up from Washington, D.C. We had uh, some prominent congressmen from Wisconsin here yesterday in the park. Drove up, decided to visit the battlefield. Drove all through the battlefield, enjoyed his visit, had a licensed battlefield guide, uh, overly impressed with the whole thing, gets back to D.C., and he writes a piece of correspondence on a typewriter, for those of you that would remember those, and sends it here to the park and inquires to our park superintendent. So, you know, I had a really great trip, enjoyed my time here. However, I did not see a monument to the soldiers from the state of Florida. Did I perhaps miss it? I drove all over the battlefield, enjoyed my visit very much, but I did not see a monument honoring the men that fought here from the, my native state of Florida. And the park superintendent would write back and say, no, you're absolutely right. You did not see one because there is not a monument to the, Florida, the Floridians that fought here during the Battle of Gettysburg. And so through this congressman's work in the state legislature of Florida, within a handful of months, from the time this gentleman visits to July 2nd of, of 1963, this monument comes to fruition. As a matter of fact, the uh, budget appropriations and the design of this thing wasn't ready till March of 1963. Construction doesn't begin till June, just about five, six weeks before the uh, 100th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. But lo and behold, the monument will go up. The monument will go up and it will honor uh, these men from Florida. But perhaps one of the most controversial aspects of the monument is the text. There was a lot of debate back and forth about what should be on this monument amongst the designers, amongst the, the uh, representatives of the state of Florida and, and the, the National Park Service back in 1963. Uh, for those of you that are back, I'll read it for you. It says, Floridians of Perry's Brigade, comprised of the 2nd, 5th, and 8th Florida Infantry, fought here with great honor as Memberson, members of Anderson's Division of Hills Corps and participated in the heaviest fighting of July 2nd and 3rd, 1863. The brigade suffered 445 casualties of the 700 men present for duty. Like all Floridians who participated in the Civil War, they fought with courage and devotion for the ideals in which they believed. By their noble example of bravery and endurance, they enable us to meet with confidence any sacrifice which confronts us as Americans. Amen. And there is definitely some interesting text that was placed upon that monument, and we could spend a good while talking about that. Uh, but suffice it to say, the monument does go up. There's a, a, a dedication on July 2nd of 1963 in extreme heat 
that day uh, not too long ago. Yes, sir? So what's controversial about it? We're going to tie that in throughout the program today. I'm going to keep you in suspense. So who are these men then uh, that this monument talks about, these Floridians who participated in the Civil War? The units that are going to fight here on July 2nd, 1863, and the next day on July 3rd, 1863, comprise three regiments, the 2nd, 5th, and 8th Florida. Now, when the Civil War broke out in 1861, a regiment on paper is about 1,100 men. Two years into the American Civil War, numerous battles, illness, and disease, the sizes of those regiments have uh, decreased drastically. Uh, in particular, by the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, the average size unit is about 200 to 230 men uh, altogether uh, per regiment. So you can see when we start talking about three units, a brigade, 700 men present for duty, it's not a whole lot of men. And these guys are going to be in the thick of it, both on July 2nd and July 3rd of 1863. Now these men are largely coming from northern Florida, about a 300 to a 350 mile stretch from the Gulf of Mexico out to the Atlantic Ocean along what we call today the Panhandle area of Florida itself when they sign up about two years before the Battle of Gettysburg. There will be some Georgians that will join these Floridians. They'll cross over the border into the state of Florida and enlist with the 2nd, the 5th, and the 8th. There'll even be some uh, uh, Floridians that will come from some very small backwoods cities like Tampa. Can you believe Tampa being a small, marshy, backwoods city today? Mm -hmm. My goodness. Uh, but by and large, the men that are going to join these units and fight in the Army of Northern Virginia here during the Battle of Gettysburg and these Florida units are coming from that panhandle uh, region of Florida, that 300, 350 mile stretch give you a little bit of information about who is leading these men that are making their way here to the Battle of Gettysburg. <clears throat> One of their earliest commanders is a man by the name of Edward Perry. Edward Perry uh, gains command of this brigade following its reorganization after the Battle of Antietam where they had sustained a number of casualties. However, just before the Battle of Gettysburg and the Gettysburg Campaign itself, uh, May of 1863, Perry's going to develop typhoid fever. And when Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia sets off on the Gettysburg Campaign, leaving Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville area defenses on June 3rd, Perry is just too ill to travel. And he's going to remain behind. However, if you look at any maps of the Battle of Gettysburg, study any actions of July 2nd, you'll often hear his name, Perry's Brigade. However, Perry's brigade, such as that inscribed on the monument, is actually commanded by another man by the name of David Lang. And now Lang is uh, originally the commander of the 8th Florida Infantry. He was born in Camden County, Georgia, has pre-war military experience. He is a graduate of the Georgia Military Institute in 1857, but would later move to the state of Florida to become a surveyor. He bounces back between Florida and Georgia. In 1861, he's one of those men that are in Georgia that crosses the state line into Florida and will initially sign up with the 1st Florida Regiment, a 12-month enlistment. And at the end of his 12 months, he decides to return back to Florida, raise a new unit, and that new unit will be the 8th Florida, which will be enlisted in 1862. He'll be elected captain. Uh, in February of 1862 and over the course of the next year will rise through the ranks eventually making his way to Colonel in April of 1863. Following in his place a man that we will hear from today will then be Commander Lieutenant, Com uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bea uh, will take command of the 8th Florida Infantry in Lang's stead. Now the Floridians have a long way to go just to get here. On July 1st of 1863, they're encamped about 19 miles west of here in a place known as Fayetteville, Pennsylvania. And the previous two days have been really nice. June 29th, June 30th, these guys are having the time of their life in Pennsylvania. Imagine being a guy from Florida. You have never seen farms like this in Pennsylvania, nor have you seen the abundance that these farms are producing here in central Pennsylvania. And so on June 29th and June 30th, what these guys from Florida are doing? Well, they're going shopping. They're going to all these farms. 
and they're getting fresh milk and eggs and they're appropriating chickens and roosters and cows and they're having a really good meal something they haven't had in a while as they've been covering over 200 miles over the last four weeks marching northward through the state of Virginia into Maryland and Pennsylvania on the morning of July 1st however the brigade is going to be asked to with the rest of the division head to Gettysburg. As all of us know, the Battle of Gettysburg begins in the morning of July 1st. The Confederate Army and the Federal Army are both not up in strength, meaning they do not have all of their forces with them, and so the calls for reinforcements are going out. And the Floridians, along with the rest uh, uh, of these men in the Confederate Army, are going to be marching towards Gettysburg. But oh my gosh, do they have an experience. The Floridians grab the very smallest straw possible. They are the last units on that line of march on July 1st. They are literally eating and choking on the dust of the wagon train of the Army of Northern Virginia. But it doesn't affect them. Benjamin Page, uh, a soldier, one of the Floridians, recalled the moments of that march towards the battlefield of Gettysburg on July 1st and what it was like to be with the Floridians that day. He said, our army was full of life and confidence, flushed with recent victories, Though we have been on the march for more than a month in all kinds of weather except cold, and part of the time marching day and night on short rations, foot sore, ragged and some barefoot, we remained jovial and in good health, good rifles and plenty of ammunition. We thought we could whip Meade's army and capture the city of Washington, D.C. Between the hours of 4 and 5 p.m., as the Federal Army's line of battle west and north of the town of Gettysburg is collapsing and they're beginning their retreat through the town itself towards a rallying point on Cemetery Hill, the Florida Brigade and the rest of their division, Anderson's division, have arrived to Hare's Ridge. And there they will go into camp for the rest of the evening of July 1st. As they begin to settle and look around and look out over the battlefields of the last nine and a half hours of fighting, one Floridian, a man by the name of Edmund Patterson, oh, excuse me, from uh, an Alabamian, Edmund Patterson of the 9th Alabama, talked a little bit about what was on everybody's mind as these fresh reinforcements have arrived. Is this thing over? Are we going to see combat? Do we get a chance to pitch into Meade's army? And here's what Patterson wrote on the evening of July 1st. He said, quote, We all knew that one day's work could not decide the contest between two such powerful armies. Our noble army, flushed with a long series of victories and feeling unlimited confidence in the ability of General Lee and the justice of the cause for which we were fighting, were eager for the fray. Around dawn on July 2nd, 1863, the Floridians will be called up. They will head east to Seminary Ridge a very long, tall, wooded ridge line where they will turn south. And as they march south, they'll eventually make their way here towards this position and our next stop in the shade. I'll have you follow me. Now, as we're going to see over the next two hours, July 2nd is a really long and tragic day <laughs> for the men of the three regiments of the Florida Brigade. And their day is going to start incredibly early. In the pre-dawn hours, orders are going to go through the three regiments to get up, get their stuff together, and fall into line. And they'll begin their march from Hare's Ridge, as I previously mentioned, to Seminary Ridge before turning south and making their way down the very same road. And obviously, the road wasn't here in 1863, but down this ridge line on top of, uh, of this ridge on Seminary Ridge down towards this position. It is going to be very hot, be very humid, it's be very dry on July 2nd. James Johnson, an adjutant in the 5th Florida, said July 2nd was a cloudless day and the heat was very intense. One of the questions that we often get here at the battlefield is, do you know what the weather was like during the battle? Yes, we do. Thank goodness for teachers in this country, right? Right, right. A teacher teaching at Gettysburg College had a number of different meteorological uh, pieces of equipment spread out on the, on the rooftop the college buildings and he would literally risk life and limb throughout the building or throughout the the uh, the battle to go to all of these buildings and run up and write down all of those measurements 
And so we know what the cloud cover was like at multiple periods of the day. We know what the temperature was like at multiple periods throughout the day. What they can't measure in 1863 is humidity. But you all standing here today know that there is humidity in South Central Pennsylvania. And you can only imagine how intense that heat was as our adjutant of the fifth Florida described. It's going to take from the pre-dawn hours till about 10 o'clock before the Floridians go into position where you are now standing. And once they arrive here in this uh, uh, woodlot, if you will, on the back side of Seminary Ridge, they waste no time preparing their position. Um, what time do they arrive? About 10 o'clock. About 10 a.m. they get into this position. Uh, it is a massive position. The Florida Brigade is part of a division under the command of Richard H. Anderson. Richard H. Anderson's division is, has an unenviable task, and we're going to spend a lot of time at our next stop talking about Anderson's division. But Anderson has to cover, with five brigades, approximately 1,750 yards. That is a huge expanse of ground, particularly when we're talking about brigades such as the Florida Brigade that only has 700 men to fill up this line. He has an unenviable task uh, this morning going into position. Like I said, we'll talk a lot about that at our next spot. But uh, following the war, uh, Lang, David Lang, who commands the brigade here uh, throughout the battle on July 2nd, July 3rd, will write to the earliest historian of the Battle of Gettysburg, a man by the name of John Badger Batchelder, <coughs> and he'll recall this moment. He said, we occupied on the second day of July 1863 the line of the eastern edge of a grove, Spangler's Woods, whence we had a full view of the heights opposite and the enemy's position. Lang's division commander, Richard H. Anderson, recalled his units going into position here. He said the enemy's line was plainly in view, about 1,200 yards in our front, extending along an opposite ridge somewhat more elevated than that which we occupied, the intervening ground being slightly undulating, enclosed by rail and plate fences and under cultivation. A soldier in another one of Anderson's brigade, a man by the name of Westwood Todd from Mahomes' brigade. Like many soldiers after arriving in this position, is going to do what? You think they're going to hang around, just flop to the ground? They're going to go explore. And many of them are going to walk out of these woods, begin to look around, and see the Union position in the distance. And then we're going to record those thoughts and feelings as they realize that one day will not decide this contest. And odds are, before the sun goes down, they will be ordered forward. Westwood Todd said this, he said, several times during the morning, I went up to the top of the hill with a view of looking at the ground over which we would probably have to charge. The enemy occupied a more elevated range of hills, about 1,400 yards from our line, the intervening space being open field under cultivation. In all of my experience, I never had so good an opportunity of calmly surveying the field and contemplating the dangers which we had to encounter. Although I never had any presentiment that I was going to be killed or wounded in any fight, when I looked over that valley and thought of the shot, shell, spherical case, grape and canister, Mene balls to which we would be exposed in charging over those 1,400 yards, I hardly hope to come out unhurt. I think Westwood Todd will speak for a lot of the men in Anderson's division in the Florida Brigade on July 2nd, 1863, when he hardly hoped to come out of this fight unhurt. As the hours of July 2nd, the morning, begin to tick by, there's going to be some developments that are going to impact the Floridian line here where you stand today. For those of you that are familiar with the Gettysburg story, you know about one particular Union Major General, a man by the name of Daniel Sickles. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Daniel Sickles is one of seven Corps commanders in the Federal High Command one of seven major generals commanding these corps. He's the only one with no pre-war military experience. We could spend a whole program talking about Daniel Sickles and what he does here at Gettysburg. 
But suffice it to say, Sickles is unhappy with the position that he has been assigned by Army Commander General George Gordon Meade. And one of the things that Sickles and Meade will jockey about throughout the day is an opportunity to perform a reconnaissance, to find out what is back here on the east, or excuse me, the western side of Seminary Ridge. And so, a number of men from the state of Maine, some United States State sharpshooters, will be sent out on a reconnaissance mission. And they're going to make their way along the present-day Wheatfield Road, which was here at the time of the battle, across those open fields of cultivation that Westwood uh, Todd talked about, and make their way into some woods behind you. Now, in that sector of the line is a number of Alabamians commanded by Cadmus Wilcox. And Wilcox is uneasy. Some of his units are starting to engage with these Maine from, uh, men from Maine and these sharpshooters, and he's beginning to call up for reinforcements. So when he sends up, up the chain of command to, to Richard Anderson, the division commander, hey, I got a little firefight going on over here. I may need some assistance, send some reinforcements. The next closest units in line are the Floridians. And they pull out, and they begin to march towards the support of the Alabama. But this is not a sustained piece of combat. This is a reconnaissance. These federal soldiers are not here to fight all day. They're here to probe enemy strength, probe the enemy position, get their intelligence, and read. <laughs> By the time the Floridians get the orders to go forward, come to the assistance of Wilcox, get up, get in line, march just this short distance and deploy into line of battle, the federal reconnaissance is gone. And they're falling back towards the, the uh, line of the Army of the Potomac and to, to inform General Sickles about what they've discovered. But this will have a impact on Lang, commander of the Florida Brigade. And the impact is this. He doesn't feel as safe as he once did in his position. When the Floridians arrive, they have this wonderful stone wall, and you can barely make it out amongst the tall grass to your right and rear. But they go into position. But we are on the western side of Seminary Ridge. This is not the military crest of the hill. This is not a great defensive spot when you have all these woods in your front and you can't see what's coming. And so Lang has pushed forward not only a number of skirmishers to the other side of the woodlot have a much better view to make sure a reconnaissance doesn't happen again, he orders his men to start building earthenworks. Well, they're going to use what they have on hand, cups, tinware, spades, whatever they've got, to start throwing up some earthen entrenchments. But one of the neat things about taking a drive down Seminary Ridge today and down West Confederate Avenue is something that we don't often talk about. The Confederates are going to build trench entrenchments during their stay here on July 2nd and July 3rd. And many of those have not been touched in 155 years. If you know where to look, you can see the handiwork of Lee's army all those years ago. And so that is the point of why we are going to take a little walk in the woods, as they say, on our way to the next stop. So you can see where these Floridians are going into place and get a little understanding of, of the terrain and what they had to work with as they threw up these very hastily built breastworks throughout the early afternoon of July 2nd, 1863. As we make our way there, it is a horse trail. Watch out for any sort of landmines, landmines on the horse trail. It is a little bit muddy. Don't feel like you need to run to catch up. Last thing we need is someone slipping and falling or losing a shoe. All right, we will meet you at the other side as we make our way through uh, of the little woodlot or grove as it was described. All right, I'll have you follow me. That is just like an 1863 army on the march, spreads out like an accordion. Questions? Things that aren't making sense? Something you're curious about? Did we... No, so the Floridians is a great question. The Floridians are not part of the counter march. The counter march is the Confederate Army's first corps, James Longstreet. Uh, the Floridians and their division commanded by Richard H. Anderson are in the third corps under A.P. Hill, and that's going to tie into our story here in just like two to three minutes. 
Another question, yes, sir. Westwood, Todd, what uh, regiment was he with? Ah, uh, I'd have to look it up. He's in Mahone's brigade. He is a Virginian. Not sure what what unit though. Any other questions? Did we pass the trenches? Yes. So we did pass the trenches, and uh, the best time to come and see them is the winter. Yeah. You will you can't hardly see them uh, in the summertime, nor do you want to go through the stuff that's going to make you itch severely this time okay, of year. Um, but if you do come back in the winter months, wait till the ground is frozen and everything's down and you take that same trail, you'll be able to see them. They're not much left. They haven't been touched. You know, many of the, the fortifications we see, you know, the lunettes on Cemetery Hill, those things those have been rebuilt over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, the Confederate fortifications here, the floor, the floor, floor excuse me, Floridians, mm -hmm. further north along Seminary Ridge, stuff they built on July 3rd, post Pickett's Charge has not been touched. If you know where to look, you can you can find those certainly. Okay, what we're going to spend some time doing now is setting up the Confederate plan for July 2nd and how it's going to impact the Floridians as they make their way across this landscape 155 years ago. And one of the things I'm going to do is put into service some volunteers on this program so we can get a visual understanding of how all of this is going to work. Now on the morning of July 2nd, 1863, both commanding officers of each army, Robert E. Lee in command of the Army of Northern Virginia, George Gordon Meade in command of the Army of the Potomac, are both working to come up with a plan for the day. George Gordon Meade at his headquarters opposite us, about a mile and a half, is thinking about an assault. Meade is an aggressive commander. Uh, the units that are here on the battlefield from the Army of the Potomac on July 1st have been, for the most part, fighting on the defensive. And now since Meade's arrival late on the first, early morning hours of the second, uh, Meade is not only putting his army in a position, a line of battle across the landscape in front of us, but he is looking to go on the attack. General Meade has placed his army in a three mile long line of battle, which will begin on the Union left opposite your right, a location known as Little Round Top, or intended to be Little Round Top. If you look out to your right front, you'll notice a white house and a red barn behind it. Just to the left, oh, maybe four inches across the horizon, you're going to see a bald open hill. That's Little Round Top. That'll be the extreme left end, or the intended extreme left end, of the federal line. If you continue to trace it leftwards across the horizon, you're heading north along the federal line of battle. And if you make your way to a small white barn to your left in front, the trees just to the left and behind it are Cemetery Hill. There at Cemetery Hill, the Union line will make a bend and it will head southeastward from the town of Gettysburg and end on a location known as Culp's Hill. If you find that white barn and white house to your left and front again, and now go to the right across the horizon, I can see an equestrian statue of General George Gordon Meade. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Those dark trees behind it in the distance is Culp's Hill. Wow. So three miles, Culp's Hill to Cemetery Hill, all the way down to Little Round Top. Now, as I mentioned, General Meade is looking to go on the assault. The strongest end of his army's line on the morning of July 2nd with the troops that are up is the right end of his line. Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill has been well defended and well put together after the retreat of the afternoon of July 1st. And so Meade is very busy at looking at launching an assault from Cemetery and Culp's Hill towards the Confederate Army's left flank south and east of Gettysburg. As Meade is working on that plan, General Lee is working on a plan over here. And Lee has a feeling with what he wants to do, kind of has an inkling as to what he wants to do. Meade is, or excuse me, Lee is someone that uh, likes guaranteed results. And Lee will consistently use the same tactics over and over and over again if they produce good results. And what Lee is looking at doing is an all-out attack on the Federal Army's left end of their line, their left flank and rear, somewhere out here in the distance. This is not a new plan for Robert E. Lee. Not a new plan for Robert E. Lee. At Chancellorsville, massive flank assault on the Federal Army's flank and rear. At 2nd Manassas, massive flank assault on the Federal Army's flank and rear. Men are willing to stand and fight line to line. They will not stand long if they can't see who's shooting them from the side or from the back. 
These are the two weak points in any formation of 100 men, of 10 men, of 1,000 men. And it is a tactic that Lee has used with great success time and again against several different commanding generals of this federal army. And so he is looking to come up with uh, a whole host of infantry and artillery to place in line and attack the left end of the federal line opposite you. Now this plan starts very early in the morning of July 2nd. One of the first things that Lee needs to know for this plan to work is exactly where the left flank of the Federal Army rests. Where's that last guy in line? How far south do I need to go to get on the flank and in the rear of the Federal Army? Lee's going to send out a reconnaissance at about 4 in the morning. By about 7, 7.30 a.m., that reconnaissance has returned back uh, to Lee's headquarters, has shown Lee on a map the, the route that they took, and what they saw. There's a lot of problems with this reconnaissance. And we could again spend a whole nother program on the reconnaissance that happened on the early morning of July 2nd. But suffice it to say that General Lee at 7, 7.30 in the morning is under the impression that the federal left flank ends directly behind me where that modern day domed monument is in the distance. That is the Pennsylvania Memorial. It's the largest monument on the battlefield. And that's where Lee, according to the reconnaissance that he received, believes that the left end of the Union line is. Lee is going to uh, mass together a whole host, as I mentioned, of artillery and infantry to carry out this attack. And the attack has very specific orders. He is going to first attack on a south to northward axis. We are not going straight across this field. We want to go south to north. We want to strike into that flank and in that rear. We want to extend beyond the federal line to the west and to the east. At the same point in time, Lee is also making sure that his orders include the component that this assault will be an N echelon assault. You do not have to be a West Point graduate to understand this. How many of you played dominoes before? Set them up, knock them down, right? Once that first one knocks down, hits the next one, hits the next one. That is an N echelon assault. It basically means that the very first domino that you set up, once they go across and get engaged, the next domino falls. The next unit goes, and the next unit goes, and the next unit goes. And for General Lee, on July 2nd, it's going to start on his extreme right, and that N echelon assault, those dominoes are going to continue to fall along Seminary Ridge, pushing off in this direction to roll up the flank and rear the Federal Army. Playing a key role in this assault will be two divisions of the Confederate Army's First Corps under the command of James Longstreet, one division of the Confederate Third Corps under the command of A.P. Hill. And here's where the beginning of the problems lie. We are now going to be utilizing multiple units across two corps, across multiple commanders. And if these commanding officers will refuse to work together, and if they refuse to talk to each other, this attack is going to be a failure. And unfortunately, General James Longstreet, A.P. Hill, Richard H. Anderson, the division commander of the Floridians, and James Longstreet all have a bad history to plant the seeds of the assault that is going to take place on the afternoon and early evening of July 2nd. Now there's another part of General Lee's plan for the day. We're not going to get into it, but to make sure that this assault is a success, and it's again another hallmark, something that Lee's used time and again that works, is he creates diversionary attack. What Lee wants to ensure is that as his men are rolling up the federal left flank opposite you, that no federal soldiers from the other end of the line can get down here and shore it up. And so he's going to give orders to his second corps commander, Richard Stoddart Ewell, to create a diversion by making it look like faint towards Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill. We're going to get really close. We're going to get really close to Cemetery Hill. We're going to be really loud, really angry, but we're not going to bring on a fight. That ensures that they can't leave. If it looks like I'm going to attack at that position any moment, they cannot come down here and help their comrades out. All right, so now these units begin to go in position throughout July 2nd. We know with the Floridians uh, that they arrived here behind you in this wood lot off to your right and rear at about 10 a.m. 
on the morning of July 2nd. We know that they uh, pack up quickly after arriving and go off and help the Alabamians further to their right during that uh, little firefight with the federal reconnaissance. And they return back to the woodlot and begin to build those entrenchments and basically wait, wait for the order to go forward. And it is going to be a long wait. It's not going to be until nearly 3, 3.30 in the afternoon that all parts of this Confederate plan are in place. And off to the extreme right in the distance, the Confederate artillery will open up and the attack will go forward. Now, how is this attack going forward? What does this look like? How do we bring it into the Floridians? That is what we are going to talk about next. And I'm going to put some people in the line. So if you two will stand right here for me. Perfect. And you guys stand right here as well. Uh, come on up and stand right here. Wonderful. And give me four more right here. One, two, three, and four. Perfect. All right. I need uh, one person behind each one of these people. So if you'll step up for me, somebody just step up. We're getting you in place here. One person behind each. All right. Very good. All right. You are now looking at the two divisions of General James Longstreet's 1st Corps that is aligned in the distance. One of the things that Longstreet has created within each division is a brigade front. These are all representing brigades. Four brigades, four brigades, four brigades, four brigades, spread across two divisions. What General Longstreet has when he goes forward in this assault is what is known as an attack in depth. That if these troops in the front line, this 1st Brigade, make a success, they've broken the line, but they've suffered casualties, we can bring up reinforcements behind. We're attacking in depth. General Longstreet not only has this luxury of being able to attack in depth, he is able to spread out this long brigade front. He's occupying about 2,500 yards with two divisions of men. 2,500 yards and two divisions of men. He's got a very, very strong, truncated uh, depth to his assault, which is going to be going forward. But Longstreet, as I mentioned, is not the only officers' units that are going to be involved in this attack. Lee needs to keep this N echelon assault going forward. Domino, dominoes, 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 dominoes. We got to keep pushing the Union line further to the north. We want to push that flank off of that high ground in the distance. So we need more men to continue the advance. But there's a problem. The diversionary assault is going to pull part of the 3rd Corps of the Confederate Army with it. It only leaves one division. And that division is Richard Anderson's division. I need four more people. One, two, three, four. Still in park ball. One, two, let's have you come over here. One, and four. Okay. Now, these four folks, fine folks, volunteers, represent Richard H. Anderson's division. And what's your name, ma'am? Linda is representing the Floridians today. These four brigades have to occupy the same length of line that Longstreet's line has to. See a problem? Problem number one. Linda, look behind you. Do you have any help coming your way? Anderson's division cannot create an attack in depth. Any results that they achieve cannot be exploited because in order for them to cover the length of line that is necessary, 1,750 yards, they have to do a single brigade front. They have to do a single brigade front. In addition to that, look right here. Confederate First Corps, Confederate Third Corps. Communication right here is vital. They're not talking to each other. The divisional commander, Richard H. Anderson, is about a mile and a half in arrear throughout July 2nd, having a great picnic. Heard he's got some Madeira back there with him. James Longstreet, grumpy on July 2nd, even grumpier on July 3rd. The orders are ambiguous. Who is in command? Is Longstreet of the 1st Corps in command of all of these soldiers, even though these are in a different unit? 
Does General Longstreet have command over Anderson's division? Or does General Hill of the 3rd Corps have command over Longstreet's men? Does Anderson report to Longstreet or does Anderson report to Hill and then Longstreet? And can you send all those orders as this line is going forward with cannonballs and musketry flying? Does this begin to make sense? So we have Linda here representing the Floridians. Okay? Although the Confederate assault on this end of the line is going to be really, really successful when it starts. Devil's Den and Wheatfield and Peach Orchard and Emmitsburg Road, by the time the assault rolls up here to this area, things are starting to break down. And one of the biggest breakdowns is communication and coordination. So the, the question is, Lee's had all day to put these plans together. Why hasn't he figured out this command and control situation? General Lee is a very laissez-faire commander, a little French economic term there. Hands off. I've got the plan. You figure it out. That's your job. Okay. So Lee does not take an active role on the field. He comes up with the strategy and the tactics to be used for the day, and he trusts his subordinates to be able to execute, to execute uh, whatever they need to do to fulfill those objectives that he's laid out. And Miss Jackson. Mm -hmm. All right, you folks can go back to where you're comfortable. Let's talk a little bit about it now with some of the, the people that were there and share with you some of uh, their perspectives uh, all those years ago. All right, so as this position is forming up, uh, and Longstreet's attack finally goes forward about 4 o'clock. Uh, if you look just to your right in front, you're going to see a red barn. Just to the left of the red barn, I'm talking like two inches across the horizon, closest to us, you'll see a roof and some chimneys. Does everybody see that? If you look beyond that roof and chimneys, I can see dark trees way out in the distance. That is where Longstreet's attack is going to begin, about 4 o'clock on the afternoon of July 2nd. Uh, as his attack goes forward, the only thing these folks down here, Anderson's brigade, including the Floridians, can do is what? Watch. Can you imagine standing here and watching this battle unfold and knowing your turn is coming, but you don't know when or how long? Just counting those minutes. One Floridian said, we strained our eyes as we caught the roar of cannon and the rattle of musketry coming nearer and nearer. We soon see brigade after brigade going into the charge of the enemy's lines of defense. Lang himself, commanding officer of the three Florida regiments and the Florida Brigade, said this, quote, at about 5 p.m. I received an order from General Anderson to the effect that General Longstreet was driving back the enemy's left and that Wilcox would advance whenever General Longstreet's left advanced beyond him. I was ordered to, uh, to throw forward a strong line of skirmishers and advance with General Wilcox, holding the ground the enemy yielded. So what Lang is talking about is precisely that, that N echelon attack. If you folks will come back up here. This is the last unit of Longstreet's first corps. And what Anderson sends to Lang of the Floridians, he says, wait, you've got to wait until the Alabamians, let me have you step over here, sir, you're going to be the Floridians this time, you've got to wait till the Alabamians to your right go forward. And the Alabamians need to wait till the last unit of Longstreet's command is engaged. So once they move forward, step forward, and engage the enemy, now the Alabamians can go forward. And once the Alabamians go forward, then the Floridians is their turn. But you can kind of see through that quote the, the very securitous root of the order. Anderson says that Longstreet's men to, to the then to General Wilcox, then back to Lang and the Floridians. Okay, but suffice it to say, the Floridians, thank you, have a long time to wait before they're going to go into action. And Lang said it's about five o'clock when he receives the orders. Uh, that he's got to wait for the rest of Longstreet and the Alabamians to the right of Anderson's division. An adjutant by the name of Raymond Reed of the 2nd Florida said this, 
He said, late in the afternoon, we received orders to be ready to advance, and orders came. Our line of skirmishers advanced some distance under a heavy fire. Then came our line of battle. One Florida veteran remembered it this way. There goes Wilcox's brigade, and soon all to the right is hidden by dense smoke. And the rebel yell can be heard above the rattle of musketry. Then the order to us, attention, forward, charge. And we are in to the thickest of the fight. It's about 6 p.m. on July 2nd, 1863, if you were standing here, that off to your right, beyond that red barn, you would see the Alabamians begin to move out from the wood lot on Seminary Ridge and into the fields to your right. 15 minutes later, about 6.15, Lang's Floridians would go next. The 2nd, 8th, and 5th Florida. Now one of the things we're going to do as we make our way to our next stop is we are going to keep the Floridians off to our right. I figured that you folks did not want to go through this in front of you. Um, so we're going to take a, uh, a mowed path most of the way to our next stop and get you out of the tall grass and the mud. But as we are moving forward, remember the Floridians are off to your right. We are on the very left end of the Floridians. They aren't going to go any further than this fence line to your left and front. So the, the Florida line stretches this direction. Okay, before we leave and, and head to the, the next stop, any questions? Uh, what, yes, sir. What are the names of these farms? Uh, right here we have one of the Spangler family. This is the Henry Spangler farm, although he is renting out that property at the time of the battle. Uh, all of these different uh, lots, if you will, are owned by different farming families. Uh, the Floridians are going to spend a lot of their time today on Spangler's farm property. The white building across the road with the red barn behind it is the Klingel family. Uh, and they uh, um, are new to that home. They just moved in in April of 63. And then as we move a little bit further up, we have the barn behind us, the Kadori family. Is the, uh, where's the peach orchard and the wheat field? Peach orchard and the wheat field. You can see, um, you can see some like white, I don't know, I'm not a biologist yeah. or nature person, some white something out yeah. there in the distance. Just to the right of that, I can actually make out the two colored Sherfy farmhouse. Wow. Yellow on the left, brick on the right. Mm -hmm. Just to the right of that, I can see some cars and monuments. That's the peach orchard. The wheat field you cannot see from here. It is uh, surrounded by a woodlot on three sides. Yes, sir. The objective of the attack is Cemetery Hill. The objective of the attack is the left flank of the Federal Army, wherever that left flank may be. And at 7.30 in the morning on July 2nd, Lee believes it to be where the Pennsylvania Memorial rests today. However, by the time the assault goes forward at 3.34 o'clock, the left flank of the Federal Army is now but above Devil's Ridge. Den on Houck's Ridge. All right, so the angle of Longstreet's attack, which was supposed to come up the Emmitsburg Road, Correct. has changed. It is devolving. It is changing as it goes. Ooh. Yep. Yep. So the echelon attack that yes. uh, Wilcox and all the rest of them were going to participate in, their angle also has to change. Absolutely. Yep. And we're going to get into that at the next stop. We'll see how that, that unfolds. Yep. Does Florida go forward with Alabama or after? After. Thank you. Yeah. It's about a 15 minute right. time span. Wilcox, the Alabamians right. go forward at 6. It's about 6.15 when the Floridians go forward. Something to keep in mind too, 6.15 p.m. today in 2018, still pretty light outside, right? No daylight savings during the American Civil War. So as this attack is taking place, the sun is beginning to set behind you. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Boxdale, Mississippi, we're in that too. Yes, way down there. Um, not as far as that tower, the observation tower to your right, a little closer to us, but yes. Larry. You got a good fix on the peach orchard right here. You can see it pretty clearly. Yeah, yeah, there's certain little bumps and hills and rises in this area that will, will get you a different point of view. All right. It is 6.15 p.m., July 2nd, 1863. Like the Floridians, let's move out. All right, well, the reason why we stopped here is because you are on what many Floridians recalled in their writings as the first rise. 
As we came past that artillery battery, you may have noticed we went down into low ground into a swale, and we just came back up a gentle rise, and it was here that the Floridians would start to receive some of their first contact from federal soldiers. As we talked about at our last stop, a little bit how that N-Echelon attack was supposed to work from south to north, as Longstreet's assault is going forward and each one of those dominoes is falling, they're beginning to realize the left flank of the Federal Army is not where it's supposed to be. And so instead of attacking from due south to due north, they're having to go in almost at an oblique or an angle while still trying to hold true to this order and plan that Lee has come up with. For the Floridians, when they go forward at 6.15 and begin to make their way down this little swale and up this first rise, there's absolutely no way that they can move off even towards an oblique because the fence line here right and forward, not this one five feet from me, but the next one up on the top of that second line is littered with skirmishers from the 1st Massachusetts and some Pennsylvania units that are firing towards Lang's men. And remember what I said, your, the flank in the rear is the weakest point on any formation of men. And so if Lang was to come out and start following that order, he's going to expose his flank and his rear to that line of skirmishers. So he's got to square up. He's got to square up. So he's going to attack from a due west to a due east direction. Now when the Floridians step off at 6.15 p.m. on July 2nd, several those there that night that witnessed the moment recorded it. Richard Anderson, the division commander, wrote in his report on August 7th, just several weeks later, he said, never did troops go into action with greater spirit or more determined courage. Lang, the brigade commander, said, a dash across an open field one and a half miles wide, every foot of which was swept by the enemy's artillery and musketry was to be had. Is that much different than what's on the monument? A little bit different than what's on the monument. We're gonna keep getting into that. Lieutenant William Pigman of the 8th Florida said our brigade advanced beautifully. We were soon under fire, but driving the Yankees like chaff before us. From the opposite side, federal soldiers of the 3rd Corps under the command of Andrew Atkinson Humphreys vividly described the approach of the Floridians and Anderson's men, the Alabamians and now the Floridians. He said this, quote, our batteries kept up a rapid fire and beyond our core to the left, a terrible pounding and crashing was going on. The breeze was blowing from the southward and it carried the heavy sulfurous smoke in clouds along the ground, at times concealing everything. Our skirmishers now began a lively popping, the first drops of the thunder shower that was to break upon us. An aide rode up with the report that heavy masses of the enemy were gathering in our front and to prepare for an attack. A copious shower of shell and canister from the enemy was followed up by the diabolical cheers and yells, and here they come, rang along the line. Colonel Lang, commander of the brigade, talked about this moment from where you stand on this first hill. He said we moved forward being met at the crest of the first hill with a murderous fire of grape, canister, and musketry. John B. Johnson, another Floridian, said the enemy's guns were making great gaps in our lines and the air seemed filled with musket balls. Our men were falling on all sides. Look how far the Floridians have come, not too far. And they are already under this immense amount of fire. Federal artillery, uh, cannons, that have moved forward along the Emmitsburg Road. And if you look to your right and rear, you may see a car every now and then move around, but particularly where that uh, white house and red barn is in the distance, uh, we've got federal artillery fire that as soon as they come out of this low ground, they're now up here on this rise, they are a perfect backdrop. And federal artillery begins sweeping the area. As this artillery fire is falling in and amongst the Floridians, the federal skirmisher at that fence line in the distance, as one of those federal soldiers recalled, began to, to uh, pick up an active popping, the first drops in this thunderstorm that was about to break upon them. When you are under fire as a unit that the Floridians are at this moment, the best thing to do is to keep pushing forward, to redress the ranks, 
to get from point A to point B as quickly as you can. The Floridians are not going to stop to return fire. The weight of the attack should push back and throw those skirmishers back towards their main line. So Lang is going to continue to yell out orders and commands to keep the three regiments, about 700 men strong, pushing forward down this slope, this next little slope, and up to the next rise, which again is very vividly recalled by the Floridians that participated in that assault. So as we continue to push forward towards the next rise, imagine the artillery fire, imagine the musketry fire beginning to take a toll on these Floridians as they push forward. This is a great way to get us started back at our uh, uh, stop here, which is where's the right and left of the, the three regiments, the Florida Brigade in, in total compared to we where we are. Again, keep in mind for us to stay out of what is to your right and rear, uh, we have been going along this fence line, which would have been the left end of the Floridians. The rest of the Floridians start at this fence line and move off to your right. A good majority of the fighting that we're going to talk about right now, the fire that the Floridians are going to experience here at this, what they call the second rise in their accounts of the battle, is going to take place in this uh, orchard field just to, behind me to your right in front, not more than, what, 50 yards away from us, okay? Now, to reorient you from where we are, where we just got here, the Emmitsburg Road, much clearer view now, the Emmitsburg Road in front of you. There is federal artillery uh, lining up along the Emmitsburg Road off in the distance around the Klingel Farm, but by this point they are starting to peel out because of the fighting that is happening down on that sector of the line. In front of us is a division or the right end of the division uh, of Andrew Atkinson Humphrey's 3rd Corps uh, unit. They too are beginning to collapse. The N echelon attack is working for the most part. It's working for the most part. How or, or why it does is when you uh, launch in an echelon attack, the object is to eventually puncture a hole in the line. And, and if we can have my friends from Georgia up here, let's have you, sir, stand on the end. Virginia. Oh, I'm sorry, Virginia. Um, whew, don't want to call it. <laughs> 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 All right. So when we do this N echelon attack, uh, the object is eventually, eventually a hole will open up. So if I'm... Uh, we're just enemy combatants. We're not lining this up to the battlefield. As the first unit in, well, once we start fighting, what's your natural inclination going to do to headquarters? What are you going to send for? Backup. So we're going to pull it from somewhere else on the line. So come stand behind him. All right. Now, the next unit, maybe it's not square on. Maybe we're somewhere here in the middle. All right. And what are you going to ask for? I want to keep fighting. I want more men. You want more men. So go stand behind there. So when the next Confederate unit comes through the line, what has happened? A natural hole is opened up because you're stripping men from the opposite end of the line to send to the opposite end. That's the whole principle of an N echelon attack is that at some point you keep sending more and more and more down that at some point an opening will happen along that enemy line. Okay, And it's beginning to tell. Uh, Sickles advanced position like dominoes from its extreme left is starting to fall and they are peeling back south to northward along this advanced position Okay, so we, we understand we're clear about where the Floridians are off in this direction The fighting is going to take place on the second rise in this orchard and what's happening with this N echelon assault at this time Okay All right. So we get to the second rise we talked about at the first rise that the Floridians are beginning to come under fire. But by the time they get here, this ground is even a little higher yet. And we are now exposed to the line of infantry along the Emmitsburg Road to your right in front. It's only about 300 yards from the line of Floridians when they crest this second rise. And so for the first time, they're going to sustain volleys of infantry fire. No longer is that pop, pop, popping that they described that one soldier described in Humphrey's uh, command. Now it is full on volley fire uh, by these infantry units posted along the Emmitsburg Road, the right end of Humphrey's line, as well as artillery fire. Not only do we have federal cannon off to your right in front that have began to fire in this direction, to fire in towards the flank of the Floridians, we also have federal batteries just opposite us in the distance that are now starting to open on our front. 
and perhaps at this moment, maybe 15, 20, 25 minutes into the charge, the Floridians are gonna take some of their heaviest casualties to that part. Um, Adjutant Raymond Reed of the second Florida described this moment from this ground. He said, our men charged splendidly. It was a grand sight to see gave them the yell and did drove them before us. The day was very hot and we had to charge over fences, etc., for more than a mile. As the second Florida and the eighth Florida and the fifth Florida slam into this line of federal skirmishers here along this fence line and the federal line beyond just 300 yards distance, a soldier in the first Massachusetts recalled the moment. He said the regiment made a stubborn resistance to the advancing enemy retaining its position until the Confederates were at close quarters and losing many men and some prisoners being finally forced back. The balance of the regiment formed a line on the extreme right of the brigade and there lost heavily and with the brigade contested every foot of ground while being pressed back. A very sharp fight is now gonna break out between men of the uh, Massachusetts, first Massachusetts, the 11th Massachusetts, and the 26th Pennsylvania around a farmstead owned by Peter Rogers. And it no longer stands. But if you look to your right in front, this orchard that I was telling you about, at the end of that orchard, you'll see a white picket fence. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. And I can see three really tall trees by the left end of that white picket fence. That is where the Peter Rogers uh, uh, farmstead was. And for the Floridians and the 1st, 11th Massachusetts and 26th Pennsylvania, some of the hardest fighting up to this point in the charge will occur there. What makes it such a disastrous po portion of the charge, not for the Floridians, but for the Federals, is a misunderstanding. Commanding the Federal soldiers there, about 650 officers and, and men, is an officer by the name of Joseph B. Carr. Carr believes that the units coming up towards his location are friendly units. He believes it is the falling back of the skirmishers that have been out here most of the day. And he orders the men of the 11th Massachusetts and the 26th Pennsylvania to hold their fire. Carr did not see or did not understand that when the 1st Massachusetts left this line out here, they fell back on the right end of the, of the brigade. They're already in formation. Right. And so Carr is yelling at these men not to open fire. And a few will open, and then a few more will open, and he'll ride off to that little pocket and yell at them, don't open fire. And he's telling them to wait, and wait, and wait. Wait, what? And wait, and wait. <laughs> They're friendly. Just wait. Hold your fire. This delay is insanely costly for the Federals. It will allow members of the 5th Florida to get up to that line at point blank range. And the commanding officer of the 5th Florida for the first time tells his men to open up. And the men of the 5th Florida will fire in the men from Massachusetts and Pennsylvania at point <coughs> blank range. And it's at this time that Carr now realizes this is not the skirmish line, that this is a brigade of enemy soldiers that are literally on top of our position. Major Robert L. Bodine of the 26th PA recalled the moment. He said, I have never before seen such desperation on the part of the rebels who hurled their columns upon us in masses. My regiment lost 202 out of 376 <laughs> engaged. And it happened because of that costly mistake of Joseph B. Carr. Lang, in his report of the action, talking about that fight of the 5th Florida and uh, the Pennsylvanians and Massachusetts men along the Emmitsburg Road and the Peter Rogers Farm, said this. He said, the enemy fell back beyond their artillery, where they were attempting to rally when we reached the crest of the second hill. Seeing this, the men opened a galing fire upon them, thickly strewing the ground with their killed and wounded. This threw them into confusion when we charged them with a yell and they broke and fled in confusion into the woods and breastworks beyond, leaving four or five pieces of cannon in my front. When the federal line collapses, the Floridians have their eye on the prize. There are abandoned federal artillery pieces along the Emmitsburg Road. As they're making their way and consolidating their position and refilling the ranks, 
pushing ever closer to the Emmitsburg Road, a new problem opens up for the Floridians. Although they've had a lucky break because of the command delay that was given by Carr to his officers and men, by the time they go down this ridge, they're going to make their way up to the next rise. And that rise is going to expose their left end, their left end in their center, towards a battery of six 12-pound Napoleons under the command of Julian Weir. Now, Weir is in a very tough spot. By the time the Floridians make it towards that location, all his infantry around him have hightailed it out of here. And now Weir's six 12-pound Napoleons are left out in the open on the other side of the Emmitsburg Road as the Floridians are approaching. Weir recalls the desperate moments. He said in a short time the enemy showed themselves in front and in their advance towards the battery met with no opposition whatever from our infantry who were posted on my right in front. I opened with solid shot and spherical case and as they continued to advance I opened with canister. Soon it was reported to me that we were out of canister. The enemy being within a few rods of us I immediately limbered up and was about to retire when a regiment of infantry took position on my left and rear and open fire. As Weir's pulling his guns out of harm's way off into the distance, one unit, one lone regiment, the 19th Maine, is going to come to the battery's rescue. It's going to slow down the pursuit of the Federals, or excuse me, uh, the Floridians against this artillery battery and slow down their overall assault. And that's what we're going to talk about our next step. All right. Um, like I said, I tried to keep you on the, the, the path as long as possible. But we're at a point now where the Floridians are getting farther and farther away from us. And so we needed to cut across country a little bit. Um, what I want to talk about uh, once we get across the road is the 19th Maine coming up to support Weir's battery and how that's going to slow down the, the federal assault. Uh, or excuse me, the, the Floridians' assault. Boy, I can't get that straight today. The Floridians' assault and ultimately what's going to take place on the other side of the road. But I wanted to take a moment, get us all together, and we'll keep pushing forward. <laughs> it's going to have to tromp it down, folks. <laughs> the center of the Floridians now as they make their way towards Cemetery Ridge behind you. This lane was here at the time of the battle and it will split the assault of the three regiments of the Florida uh, Floridians. We're going to have a good portion of the Floridians on the left side or the north side of this fence, another portion of the Floridians on the south side, and then one unit in particular pushing right down the lane itself towards Cemetery Ridge. When they get to this point, however, they're going to face an unimaginable amount of fire. You may remember from our last stop, I talked about six 12-pound Napoleons under the command of Julian Weir of the 5th United States Artillery. When Weir sees the Floridians crest that second ridge behind you, Weir looks around and says, where are all my infantry support? Everybody's pulling out. They're racing back towards the main federal line on the southern slopes of Cemetery Ridge. And so we are realizing I do not have infantry support decides to pack up those six guns and pull them back towards the safety of the federal line. But this isn't something that happens quickly. You've got to get the battery horses together, you've got to get everything limbered up and move out. And the Floridians see these guns pulling out and the, the, they are on the scent, if you will. They are chasing after one of these very highly sought after prizes in Civil War combat. But as Weir is pulling back in the distance and making his way, he sees a unit coming up, the 19th Maine Volunteer Infantry. And the 19th Maine is huge. Uh, we talked at the beginning of the program how, you know, the standard size infantry regiment by this point in time is maybe 220, 230 men. The 19th Maine is almost two times that number. 
and they come barreling off Cemetery Ridge and out into this field in the distance. And Weir says, oh man, infantry support, I can do a lot of damage, drops the trails on the guns and opens fire. He said, I immediately came into battery again, hoping that our infantry would drive the enemy back, as their force seemed to be small and much scattered. The enemy was too close. I endeavored to get my guns off the field, succeeded in getting off but three as some of the drivers and horses were disabled while in the act of limbering up. My horse was shot at this time, and as I was rising from the ground, I was struck with a spent ball, and everything seemed to be very much confused. I hastened off with the remaining guns. After the enemy had been driven back by the infantry, the other guns were brought off. So Weir unlimbered, just gets unlimbered, starts opening up. He's got the 19th Maine in support, but the Floridians aren't stopping. They're not slowing down. And Weir decides it's too close. And he gives the order to go back into batter, uh, to, to limber up the battery and move back towards the main federal line. But it's too late. His drivers are going down. He only gets three guns off the field before he himself goes down. And it will not be until this fight is 100% over before Weir gets his guns back. Now, once the Floridians uh, get over the road, temporary brigade commander Lang is going to write Perry. Remember, Perry is the brigade commander, but he's left in Virginia with typhoid fever. He writes to Perry on July 19th to talk about this moment in the fight. He's writing the, the, you know, the, the real brigade commander saying, hey, this is how I led the men in the battle. I want you to be apprised of the situation. And Lang talks about this moment as they sweep up over the fences of the Emmitsburg Road. We think about the Emmitsburg Road obstacle on July 3rd, Pickett's Charge. But it is just as every much an obstacle for these men from Alabama further to your right, and now the Floridians here in this position. He said, quote, we swept over these, the fences, without once halting, capturing most of the guns and putting the infantry to rout with great loss. Indeed, I do not remember having seen anywhere before the dead lying thicker than where the Yankee infantry attempted to make a stand in our front. I'm sure those Virginians like that quote about the dead Yankees laying thick on the road. Um, as the 19th Maine and Weir's battery is pulling out and the Floridians are sweeping over this position and we're going to follow them up to their high water mark of July 2nd. For the first time in our program we can now bring in the next part of the story which is the number of Georgians to your left under the command of Ambrose Wright. Remember, Anderson's division, four brigades, is supposed to be the end of this massive end echelon assault. Once Longstreet's corps, or his two divisions were done, Wilcox's Alabamians went, 15 minutes later, Lang's Floridians, then the Georgians, and last but not least, on the far left end of the line, Mahone's Virginians. By the time the Floridians get here, the Georgians off to their left are just getting up to the road. And it's the weight of the Georgians, not so much of what the Floridians do, that will force the 19th Maine, 440 men strong, out of their position and to fall back. That opening, clearing this way of federal soldiers between here and Cemetery Ridge, will aid the Floridians as they push ever closer down this lane and on either side of it. So let's follow the Floridians to our last stop of the program, their high water mark for July 2nd. You've made it all through and think about it, you knocked all this stuff down, so on the way back it's already, <laughs> it's already knocked down. Okay, um, when the Floridians get to this point, we've got to take out of our mind, shoulder to shoulder, two ranks deep. Everything that they've gone through up until this point has decimated the ranks. There are a number of company level officers that are down, there's holes in the lines, there's all these obstacles that they've had to go over, both fences on the Emmitsburg Road, this lane here which is splitting the brigade. Um, by the time they get to this point, as a brigade, as three units all together combined, they are combat ineffective. Their coordination and command and control is gone. And so what happens when they get here to the base of Cemetery Ridge, and you can begin to see how it slopes up gently behind me. By the time that they get to this point, Lang decides to call a halt to the advance. Not only has all of these obstacles uh, broken up the command and control, the engagements along the way with the uh, skirmishers of the first mass Cars Brigade with the 11th Massachusetts and the 26th Pennsylvania. 
and the speed of the assault. Once the Floridians came out of the woods on July 2nd, they got up to that first rise. And if you think back an hour ago, we talked about their, their first experience with the cannonballs and the musketry fire. Once the, they started experiencing that fire, the assault picked up in rapidity. These guys are moving at a very fast rate. So the fast rate, the, the contact with enemy soldiers and all the obstacles has obliterated the command and control. And by the time Lang gets here, as he's looking at what's in front of him, he realizes he needs to get the brigade back together again before a final push. Um, a soldier in Wilcox's brigade, just off to our right, the Alabamians, described the chaos around him to give you an idea of what the Floridians were dealing with. He said, by the time the small brushy drain, and you can see how it slopes down and that wonderful big amount of scrub brush to your right in front, uh, the Kadori Trossel thicket is what he's referring to. He said, by the time of the small brushy drain was reached, the brigades of Barksdale, Wilcox, and Perry were marked in confusion, mixed up indiscriminately, officers apart from their men, men without officers. Nevertheless, they were all pushing forward notwithstanding. It was so bad, another soldier recalled, quote, there were no longer companies or regiments, scarcely brigades. We were mingled in glorious confusion. Lang, writing about this moment, 27 days later on July 29th, talks about them halting and reforming for one final push towards the federal line. He said, quote, while engaged in reforming here, an aid from the right informed me that a heavy force had advanced upon General Wilcox's brigade and was forcing it back. At the same time, a heavy fire of musketry was poured upon my brigade from the woods, 50 yards immediately in front, which was gallantly met and handsomely re-replied re to by my men. A few moments later, another messenger from my right informed me that General Wilcox had fallen back, and the enemy was then some distance in rear of my right flank. Lang and the Floridians have a whole host of problems when they get to this point. Not only are they in absolute utter confusion and chaos, and as that one veteran recalled, indiscriminately mixed or gloriously confused, he's beginning to, to, to coordinate with Wilcox and the Alabamians to his right, and he's finding out that there's a situation developing. Wilcox is beginning to fall back. He's beginning to fall back, fall back. A brigade of New Yorkers, gloriously named the Harper's Ferry Cowards, have arrived on the scene. Reinforcements have been sent southward down the rear of Cemetery Ridge and are pushing through that thicket. And they're applying a lot of pressure on the front of Wilcox and they're stretching beyond his right. Wilcox's men start falling back. As Lang is getting that intelligence here at this position, in front of him a tremendous fire is opening up. And although his men, as he said, are, are meeting this fire and replying handsomely, Lang knows that the time is up. There's not enough time left. There's no reinforcements that he can see behind him to make one final push. He's got fire in his front. He's watching the Alabamians retreat to his right and rear, and he's watching Union soldiers pursuing them. He now has an untold number of Union soldiers in his rear his only avenue of escape out of here. And so it's at this moment that he decides to call off this one final push and to fall back. And it is a tough decision for Lang to make. He wants to make sure that it's the right decision, however. He's not gonna trust the intelligence that he sees from far away. He's not gonna trust the intelligence of men from Wilcox's command coming down here and saying, hey, we're, at, we're pulling out, we're retreating, get out of here, save yourself. Lang tells the men to keep firing, and he heads off to the right himself. And when he gets down there, he said this, going to the right, I discovered that the enemy had passed me more than a hundred yards and were attempting to surround me. I immediately ordered my men back to the road, some 300 yards to the rear. Arriving here, I found there was no cover under which to rally and continued to fall back, rallying and reforming upon the line from which we started. <coughs> Charles Eubanks of the 5th Florida said, We, however, routed the Yankees, but our men were terribly thinned. Finally, we discovered we were about to be flanked, and we were ordered to fall back, which the enemy seeing 
poured a perfect torrent of grape canister and shell after us with a terrible effect. When I arrived at the rallying line, I had only five left in my company, the rest being wounded, killed, or captured. Now from this position, we're gonna talk about the Floridian's retreat towards the Emmitsburg Road. Very loud, noisy up there, tall grass. So I want you to imagine the, fe the uh, uh, Federals pursuing the Floridians towards the Emmitsburg Road. And the Emmitsburg Road behind you is going to be the first rallying point. Lang's gonna lead the men there, he's gonna have them plant the colors, and he's gonna try to slow the advance of these Federal soldiers. When Lang gets there, and he gets the brigade in position along the road. He realizes immediately the reason why the Federals couldn't hold it when he assaults that position 10, 15 minutes earlier. The Emmitsburg Road is relatively flat behind you. Look how flat it is. Moves up towards the south, rises up towards the north, but right behind you in the position of the Floridians, it's flat. Not only is it flat, do you see anything great for cover in that position of the Emmitsburg Road? It is wide out in the open. Lang only holds the, holds the Floridians there for moments. They fire a volley, maybe two, and orders them to continue the retreat, to make their way back towards the woods from which they had started from. Adjutant Raymond Reed of the 2nd Florida recalled the moment as they are fighting around the Emmitsburg Road. He said, our men fought bravely, but did not retire from the field until ordered to do so, leaving behind our dead and wounded. Also, the battery captured in our advance, worn out and weary and sad, and prepared to rest for the night. David Maxwell of the 2nd Florida wrote on July 8th during the Confederate retreat from Hagerstown. He said, they charged the enemy's principal heights and succeeded in taking them with 40 pieces of artillery. That may be a little hyperbole. <laughs> but they were not supported in time and consequently had to fall back. Francis Flemings said, had two or three brigades been sent to support us, we could have held the position that it cost us dearly to take. As the Floridians are abandoning the Emmitsburg Road and heading back towards Seminary Ridge, Major Bodine of the 26th Pennsylvania, this is the guy that's so upset about not receiving the orders to fire uh, on Joseph Carr's command earlier in the evening. He talks about what the men in his command took the opportunity to do as they retraced their steps towards the Emmitsburg Road. He said, we were armed with the Austrian rifle of inferior quality, and I desired to change them for Springfield rifles without the red tape process. The brigade we opposed, the Floridians, were all armed with the Springfield rifles. Many of them had gone through the renovating process and bore the Richmond CS stamp. So the men of the 26th Pennsylvania are tossing away their Austrian Lorenzes and they're picking up Springfield 1861 rifles from the Floridians that have left them behind. But that's not the only thing that the Floridians have left behind. Along the Emmitsburg Road, as the Federal soldiers are sweeping through this area, uh, taking care of wounded, uh, checking in on what type of weapons they can upgrade to, by the time they get to the Emmitsburg Road, they find a very important prize, and that is the flag of the 8th Florida. The entire color company of the 8th Florida Regiment had either been killed or wounded during the advance. And as they pushed up over the Emmitsburg Road and into this swale, little did they realize that the flag had fallen behind them at the Emmitsburg Road. When they fell back in retreat, they didn't see that that flag was lying in that wonderful ditch we got our feet wet in as we made our way to this location. And they continued retreating back to Seminary Ridge. Walking along the road, Sergeant Thomas Horan of the 72nd New York, part of uh, George, or George, General Sickles Brigade, uh, Excelsior Brigade, that had been wounded in the skirmish uh, earlier in the afternoon, came along, saw the flag, picked it up, and turned it in. And for that action, he would be cited for conspicuous gallantry. <laughs> so we're now going to make our way, slowly but surely, all the way back towards the Virginia Memorial where we spent all that time by the artillery battery setting up uh, the actions and the attack that would take place. Once we get back there, we're gonna talk about what the cost was for these men. We're gonna go back to where they met their medical staff and where there was makeshift wagons 
that were ready to take the Floridians to their hospital, who was left standing in the line, and ultimately where the finger was pointed for the failure of this assault to capture Cemetery Ridge. So let me work through you. I'll lead our way back. We'll take our time and we'll all rally together for the conclusion at the Virginia Memorial. Uh, yes, they are part of the plan. They are ordered to go forward. They go maybe a hundred yards, excuse me, 150 yards. And they are just receiving unimaginable artillery fire, them and the Alabamians. And then they just turn around and go back. Yeah, they don't even go to the Emmitsburg Road. Yep. Yes, sir. How close did Richard Anderson ever get to the action that day? Not close at all. Uh, probably couldn't even hear it from where he was. Did you ever read his uh, battle report? Yeah, uh, his battle report reads like he was in the thick of the fighting. Um, but um, at several times during the action, um, you know, Lang is sending back for reinforcements. Wilcox is sending back for reinforcements. The next part of our story, Ambrose Wright is sending back for reinforcements. And one of the problems is, you see how far we came. They're sending a messenger on horseback from there to here and then another mile beyond. Anderson's in the rear. He's, he's literally, when I'm saying having a picnic, he is having a picnic with the staff of his division uh, during this assault. He's not uh, superintending this assault at all, at all. Any other questions as we continue to gather? Yes, sir. Um, I know it is Lang's brigade. Yes. Yeah. What is the, what's the protocol there? Lang, Perry. So Lang is the temporary brigade commander because of Perry's illness. So technically speaking, it is Perry's brigade, but it is Lang who leads the unit through the campaign, the battle, the retreat, the whole nine yards. Until he's official, until he officially gets that brigade, until he receives um, promotion to command that brigade, it would still be Harry's brigade. Okay. Yeah, but you'll see it written both ways. Yeah, like the monument says Perry's brigade, right. even though it's Lang doing all the heavy lifting here. So Perry never came back. Um, Perry's not going to be around for the Gettysburg campaign. He'll rejoin the unit once they make their way back down to Orange Courthouse. We're talking August of 63. Yeah. they ever restrict from the Florida brigades or they dissolve them into other units? The, the Florida brigade, uh, they are going to continually try to recruit, but you can imagine it's much easier to press guys into service from Virginia when you're in Virginia, but getting recruits back for, for Florida is going to be a, a challenge. Um, there will be an effort. Yeah, 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 it's uh, definitely a challenge. There's only, I mean, the population of Florida is not that big. And it's also, you know, uh, we've got federal forces in Florida too, and fighting going on as well. So, I mean, it's a challenge. It'll be a challenge. Yes, sir. Uh, where's AP Hill during all this? Where is AP Hill all during this? That is a great question. Um, AP Hill is very sick during the Gettysburg campaign. Uh, he's pretty ill on July 1st, not much better on July 2nd. Uh, much like Anderson, Hill is not that much involved in this assault as well. Uh, Hill's, not only is Hill not involved, his division commanders are almost taking a page out of his playbook. Anderson's at a, at a picnic uh, a mile away. The next brigade in line, or division in line, um, that is supposed to participate in this diversionary attack on Cemetery Hill, um, as well as uh, Robert Rhodes' division, which is also supposed to, to take part in that as well. These guys are um, absconding command and looking for you know, uh, junior officers to do this stuff. So the, really the high command in the Confederate Army, the Army of Northern Virginia on July 2nd, is just a mess. Just a mess. Yeah. So Yule didn't lead that attack until 7 p.m. Yeah, so Yule, Yule's got some very interesting orders. Uh, Yule's supposed to go forward once he hears Longstreet's men engage. Uh, there is some scientific slash historical debate whether or not Yule could hear the opening of Longstreet's assault. Uh, you got to remember that the left end of the Confederate line is on the southeastern side of the town of Gettysburg. And with the rolling terrain, there may have been something called acoustic shadows that played into it. So Yule doesn't necessarily start 
when Longstreet does. At the same point in time, Yule's artillery gets caught up in this uh, duel of an hour and a half, a 90 minute artillery duel, which then pushes back when the infantry goes forward. Yep, yep. Yes, sir. What role uh, did the Floridians play on July 3rd, if any? Yeah, role of July 3rd. Uh, the Floridians will be included in Pickett's charge. Um, they'll be part of the many units that Lee cobbles together that have already seen their fair share of fighting. Uh, Lang and Wilcox will go forward. They'll go forward maybe 100, 150 yards, not very far at all. Um, by the time they come out of that low ground and they start cresting towards the Emmitsburg Road, they're just getting raked with artillery fire. Uh, and this is already after Pickett's men are in full retreat. And so they do not go forward very far uh, before turning around and heading back. So a very, very minor role. It's negligible. It has no direct impact on the charge. Okay. Two final things before we wrap up the program. We've got to talk about what was happening to Lang's left as he is in retreat. And we've got to talk about the moment that the Floridians make it back here and what the cost of this assault was. We may recall from our last stop, a mile, mile and a quarter from here, uh, that Lang determines there's not enough left for that frontal assault. The, the Alabamians to his right are in full retreat. He's got Union soldiers on his right and in his rear. He's receiving murderous fire from Cemetery Ridge on his front. The command and control of the brigade is gone. The number of, of officers at the company level, the regimental level, have been killed and wounded, and Lang orders a retreat. Multiple times, Wilcox and Lang have, have sent back for reinforcements. We need help. We need to shore up this line. Uh, sending uh, messengers all the way back to Richard Anderson and join his picnic on the other side of Seminary Ridge. And those reinforcements are not going to come. And when Lang finally gets back here, Lang is not the only one that is feeling this uh, anger, this frustration about not being reinforced. Because there was another brigade two more brigades and Anderson's divisions left to go forward, only one of which did, and it was the next brigade in line. And it was a brigade of Georgians under the command of Ambrose Wright. Ambrose Wright is going to be that last domino that's going to fall in this N echelon attack, which started opposite Big Round Top and has been rolling up northwards along Seminary Ridge and Cemetery Ridge for the last three hours. As the Floridians are falling back and making their way to the Emmitsburg Road, the Georgians under the command of Ambrose Wright have crossed the Emmitsburg Road and have made their way up onto Cemetery Ridge and in some instances towards the rear of the federal position. Lee's plan of this N echelon assault where eventually an opening will occur has worked. As the Georgians sweep towards that position on Cemetery Ridge, there are no federal soldiers there. The soldiers that had been originally stationed there, the Union Army 2nd Corps, had been packed up and shipped southward to help the fighting that was taking place down in the wheat field and Devil's Den in the Valley of Death uh, at Nausea. And so the Georgians get to that spot and they look back and they look back here towards Seminary Ridge and there's no one to support them. There's no one there. Wright has made the penetration in the federal line that Lee has been looking for with the start of this assault and there is no more supports. And very soon, Wright can see reinforcements of federal soldiers coming from the left, coming from the right, coming towards him. He realizes he cannot hold the position. And when Wright's Georgians make it back here along Seminary Ridge, he is furious. And he wastes no time beginning to write and make his frustrations known that it was the Floridian's fault that he was not supported, that the Floridians didn't cross the Emmitsburg Road, that the Floridians were cowards, and that they retreated well before they ever engaged the Union soldiers on Cemetery Ridge. And within a matter of days, sweeping through the Army of Northern Virginia and sweeping through Richmond, Virginia, through the newspapers, the, Florid the Floridians under the command of Lang have failed the Army of Northern Virginia on July 2nd, 1863. Here's what Ambrose Wright talks about in his report, September. He says, unfortunately, just as we had carried the enemy's last and strongest position, it was discovered that the brigade on our right, Lang's men, had not only not advanced across the turnpike, but had actually given way and was rapidly falling back to the rear. 
while on our left we were entirely unsupported. The Virginians of Mahone's brigade did not go forward. The brigade ordered to support us having failed to appear. Now that's several months after the battle. How about five days after the battle, right? Pens a note to his wife on July 8th and he says, Perry's brigade, the Floridians, on my right gave way and shamefully ran to the rear. Now Lang writes Perry and says, hey, this is what happened. And Lang goes to Anderson and says, Anderson and says look, you got to do something. We made it to Cemetery Ridge. We made it to the federal line. We were unsupported. I don't know what Wright is talking about, but he is slandering the name of the Floridians that have done nothing but gain honor on July 2nd. And so Lang basically twists Richard Anderson's arm and says, you need to come out with a statement and say that you saw the Floridians in action, which he didn't, and that they performed bravely and gallantly and heroically and made it up to the federal line. And so Anderson corrects the statement that Wright is spinning. And Anderson writes this. He says, Perry's brigade under the uh, command of Colonel David Lang advanced as bravely, as perseveringly, and as far as any troops could have done in the same situation. They were hotly engaged, suffered heavier losses and killed and wounded in proportion to their numbers than any brigade in the army and did not retire until compelled, like all others, to do so by the superior force of the enemy and the great strength of his position. So Anderson goes to their defense, but it is something that will not go away. And we go back to the beginning of the program when that congressman comes here and says, well, why is there no monument to the Floridians? Because there is this story that Ambrose Wright begins five days after the end of this battle that the Floridians performed bravely, they did not engage the enemy, they broke and ran. Why do you want to commemorate that performance in bronze or granite? It is something that won't die. And I bring it to your attention because in August of 1868, five years after Gettysburg, there are soldiers from Lang's and Perry's former brigade that are still writing to correct the actions of what happened on July 2nd. The title of the article was Justice to the Florida Soldiers, and it was sent to the Sentinel by a private in the ranks here at Gettysburg. He said, but when our good names were foully assailed and slander with her busy tongue falsely coupled the words cowards and Florida together at the fatal field of Gettysburg, wonder not that we turn like the trodden and tortured worm and deny the foul calumny and claim justice, averring that the Florida Brigade was the last to retire from the front after the gallant Wilcox's veterans had been compelled by numbers to retire, leaving the right flanks of our little band exposed to danger of being turned by the enemy. Then, and not until then, did our gallant leader, Colonel David Lang, commanding the brigade during General Perry's absence, order the brigade to retire, which it did in order and without confusion, after losing nearly two-thirds of the gallant men composing the Florida Brigade. And we have just walked in the footsteps of that retreat. By the time Lang pulls the three regiments back up here, into Seminary Ridge and this grove of trees owned by Henry Spangler, the Florida Brigade could claim the dubious distinction of having suffered the highest percentage of casualties of any brigade in Lee's army. From July 2nd, from their assault alone on July 2nd, they had sustained 40% casualties. The second Florida lost 95 men, particularly among the officers. Major Moore, wounded in the thigh and captured. Captain William Ballantine, commanded next, also wounded. Captain Alexander Mosley, collapsed from exhaustion, captured. Captain R.G. Jenkins, killed. In the 5th Florida, Captain Gardner had received a severe wound of the arm. Lieutenant Joel C. Blake was killed, and his body was, quote, so completely mutilated that it was never found. Captain John Frank was killed. Captain William Bailey, Jr., wounded and captured. Captain J.S. Cochran and Lieutenant J.A. Shaw were both mortally wounded. Second Lieutenant James H. Wentworth, Company D, counted five men left in his company out of four officers and 36 men. 
listen to all these ranks. When we got to that farthest point, and we talked about Lang drawing the unit up and trying to reform them, that command and control was gone, you can begin to understand why. There's nobody left to lead these soldiers further in that last assault. The 8th Florida only had four officers remained unhurt after the battle. Isaac Baranow would write to his sister Mary Catherine on July 10th from Winchester. He said, we went in with 57 men and came out with 16. All of my messmates came out safe that day, which was Thursday. I will tell you who was wounded that day as far as I know. Captain Love was and left on the field. Lieutenant Bruce was wounded in the leg but got out to the hospital. James McLaughlin was wounded severe in the arm. I guess it will be cut off. Bill Cox and Joe was missing. I don't know whether they was killed or taken prisoners. Lieutenant William Pigman, 8th Florida, said after driving the enemy for at least one mile and just as we were ready to make a grand charge on their last line of entrenchments, the order came to fall back. Boss was wounded when about halfway across the field. Barnes also fell as we were advancing. Burroughs was shot just as the order came to fall back and we had to leave him as there is no time to stop for friends who are hurt during the heat of an engagement. We finally got back to our starting point, rallied the men and found that our loss was heavy. Only four commissioned officers left alive and unwounded. Captain Thomas B. Livingston wounded and captured. Behind Seminary Ridge, just on the reverse slope on its western side, as the Floridians were coming back, those that were wounded continued to march on. And there waiting for them was Assistant Surgeon William F. Richardson of the 8th Florida to start his grisly work for the evening. Other staff from the brigade were spread out around this that would later become known as the Point of Woods, beginning to collect the wounded uh, Floridians that could make it back to this starting location. Staff from the brigade, teamsters, musicians, would place these men into ambulances, place them into wagons, any sort of transportation that they could and begin the long journey towards their brigade hospital north of town on the campus of Gettysburg College today. James Nixon of Company B would write to his wife on July 2nd, 1820, uh, 1863 of this moment. He said the whole brigade suffered about in the same proportion. So you see out of three full regiments from Florida, there are about three or four men left. It is stated that our division, which is Anderson's, got cut up worse than any that went into the fight. But not all hope was lost amongst the Floridians. Isaac Baranow would write again to his sister Mary Catherine on August 6th. He said, Kate, we ought not to be discouraged when our friends fall in battle, for it is impossible for us to gain our independence without losing some of our brave boys. So what are some of the takeaways then from the actions of the Floridians on July 2nd? What happened? What went wrong? Why was the attack not a success? There is plenty of blame to go around. Mahone's Virginians do not follow up on the far left of the division. Anderson's not here in person for command and control. The length of the front that he's got to fill, 1,700 yards not being able to attack in depth with brigades stacked. The blame continues to go around and around and around. James Nixon of the 8th Florida would write to his wife of those conclusions, those thoughts, those reflections on this battle on July 22nd. He said, if we gained a victory at Gettysburg, it was certainly a dear bot victory. David Maxwell, the 2nd Florida, concluded on July 8th his thoughts on this action. He said the fighting was the most desperate of the war. The enemy fighting much harder on their own soil and having the best position imaginable, but not decisive. At night, the lines were pretty much the same as in the morning. A news correspondent covering the Floridians said this, every able-bodied man should emulate the example of the brave Floridians who have sent more men to war than the number of voters in the whole state. This reminds me that in my account of the Great Battle of Gettysburg, full justice was not done to Perry's Florida Brigade. Its performance was not only credible, but gallant, as shown by its heavy loss, which, in proportion to the number engaged, exceeds that sustained by any other brigade on the field. But it perhaps summing up our program today was best said by a correspondent 
to the Richmond Enquirer, one of the most highly read papers in the capital of the Confederacy during the war. And this is what he said. It was apparent that they, that, that day they had lost. Lost after it was won. Lost not because our army fought badly, but because a large portion did not fight at all. I hope you enjoyed the program, folks. If you have any questions, please stick around. I want to chat with you about those. If not, public service announcement. When you get back to the hotel, get back to your house, please do a tick check. Uh, please do a tick check. We hope to see you again on another program at Gettysburg. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.